All right. Hello and welcome to a Tax Foundation Talking Tax Reform discussion on lessons from the 2022 tax filing season and how to improve the taxpayer experience. I'm Will McBride, Vice President of Federal Tax and Economic Policy at the Tax Foundation, and I'll be the moderator of the discussion. And we have two panelists that I'll introduce shortly. Before we start, two housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website for later viewing. All attendees are muted, but feel free to ask questions using the Q&A button on the bottom banner. Please, inc please include your name and organization when asking questions and the panelist uh, your question is directed to. For many of us, this year's tax filing season has come and gone, hopefully without too much pain and suffering. It is a complicated ritual for about 150 million tax filing households and several million more businesses. And the process seems to get more complicated every year. In fact, it has gotten quite a bit more complicated in recent years, as much of the pandemic-related relief policy was run through the tax code. Most recently, the American Rescue Plan Act was passed last March, and it established several new responsibilities for the Internal Revenue Service, including a third round of economic impact payments as direct payments to help individuals address financial stress due to the pandemic, recovery rebate credits, for those taxpayers who did not receive the full amounts allowed for the first two rounds of economic impact payments and monthly advanced child tax credit payments to eligible taxpayers beginning last July, which included establishing an online portal for, for taxpayers to opt out of the payments or provide additional information to the IRS that could affect the amount of the payments, such as the birth of a child or, or a significant change in income. We do not yet have the full picture of how the IRS is handling these new responsibilities, but early indications are concerning. For instance, a recent report from the Government Accounting Office finds that the IRS has a backlog of several million tax returns it is working through from last year's filing season. In the 2021 filing season, the IRS suspended and reviewed 35 million returns with errors, primarily due to new or, mo or modified tax credits. That's about an 86% increase over a normal year. And this led to refund delays of up to several months for millions of taxpayers. Taxpayers reached out to the IRS for help, but often were left with no answers. In, 20, in the 2021 filing season, 160 million calls were abandoned, disconnected, or received a busy signal, compared to 26 million in 2020 and 14 million in 2019. The IRS is clearly overwhelmed with these new responsibilities and taxpayers are suffering as a result. To discuss how to improve the tax filing process, both for taxpayers and the IRS, we have two experts with us today. Our first panelist is Ben Deneka, Program Manager with the Tax Institute at H&R Block. Ben manages H&R Block's relationship with the IRS and represents H&R Block in the Security Summit and industry working groups with federal and state revenue agencies. He has over nine years of experience providing expertise on federal tax administration, and in 2021 served as chair of the Internal Revenue Service Advisory Council. Ben earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Mississippi and a, a JD from the University of Mississippi School of Law. Our second panelist is Alex Mergiano, federal policy analyst at the Tax Foundation. Alex has researched and written on many issues relating to taxpayer compliance, complexity in the tax code, and ways to improve tax administration and the taxpayer experience as well as ways to reform the tax, the tax code to benefit to the benefit of the broader economy. He attended Tufts University, graduating with a degree in economics and minors in finance and political science. And with that, Ben, please take it away. Thanks, Will, I appreciate that. Let me share my slides here real quick. Great, as Will mentioned, my name is Ben Denica. I am a program manager for H&R Block and help manage our relationship with the IRS. If you're not familiar with H&R Block, we have filed over 800 million returns nation or worldwide since our inception in 1955. Uh, and just last year, we filed over 21 million returns for individuals and small businesses through do-it-yourself software products, as well as our uh, 9,200 offices nationwide. In other words, we have a front row seat to the tax filing experience, and my role in particular offers perspective on what it takes to administer tax laws from passage 
to the tax desk and beyond. With my comments today, I wanna to do a little bit of a look back at the, the most recent filing season and the, the COVID relief that was administered through it uh, and look at what worked and what could have worked better uh, in terms of administering that code or that relief. The season was a bit unique in that the tax returns still had to account for COVID relief and uh, filers' financial lives were still very much impacted by the pandemic last year throughout 2021. But on the flip side, the tax return filing experience and the tax return processing started to indicate a shift back towards normal. And to help illustrate this, I wanna look at tax refunds from this season. And this is partially an exercise in looking through the lens of a taxpayer because filers often correlate that tax filing experience with the size of their refund. And I, and I'm, I'm betting most of you all know that the refund doesn't necessarily show a complete picture of their tax situation. But I think refunds this year show an interesting story about the impacts of COVID relief because in some ways they deviated a lot from the norm and in other ways they started to move back towards the norm. So if we look at refunds at a macro level, what we're seeing this year is bigger average refunds, but fewer refunds. And, and so if you look at these stats on iris.gov through April 8th, you'll see that, that uh, in terms of the volume of refunds issued, it's up year over year, but that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the percentage of returns process that are netting a refund is down this year. So it's about 70% this year compared to over 74% last year. If we back up to pre-pandemic 2019 filing season, that was around 73% of returns that were netting a refund. If we go all the way back to pre-TCJA, it was more like 78, 79% of returns were yielding a refund. So we're seeing a market shift uh, towards balance due returns this year. At the same time, on the other end of the spectrum, we're seeing that average refunds are up 10%. And so there's this push and pull happening at both ends of the spectrum. But lastly, I wanna note that that increase in the number of refunds that we're seeing year over year seems to indicate that there's the, the non-filer population is still filing returns. So individuals who may not have filed returns three, five years ago are filing returns this year, and it looks like they're getting refunds. Now, why is this happening? How did the pandemic relief impact refunds? One of the biggest changes here was the advanced child tax credit. As a quick refresher, the American Rescue Plan Act increased the credit amount, it changed the eligibility rules, and it mandated that IRS pay half in advance. These changes were all for 2021 only. Now, one of the reasons why I think this is contributing to the balance due into the spectrum is because the withholding tables were not updated to account for this temporary change. So if a filer had submitted a form W-4 to decrease their withholding because they knew they were gonna get the child tax credit on their tax return and they wanted to inure that benefit with each paycheck instead, then if the IRS were to layer an additional direct payment on top of that, essentially you're double dipping into the amount that would eventually reduce your refund. Uh, the second bullet I've got here is on COVID-related withdrawals from retirement accounts. Under the temporary rules, you were able to withdraw up to 100,000 without being subject to the usual 10% early withdrawal penalty, uh, but you were still liable for the, the income on that distribution. So to help with the relief, you were able to spread that uh, income liability over three years. So these returns being filed now would be that second year of capturing that tax liability. The other three bullets on the balance due in the spectrum here are, are really alluding to changes in behavior that we're seeing as a result of the pandemic. And it reflects changes in how taxpayers are earning or generating income. Uh, unemployment compensation is a good example. So unemployment is still relatively high and, and filers still typically don't withhold on that income. Uh, now last year, there was an exclusion for the first $10,200 that is not in place this year. So that could certainly translate to someone getting a refund last year and then flipping to a balance due this year. On the other end of the spectrum where we have larger refunds, again, the, about, the advanced child tax credit may, is probably coming into play here as well. Uh, and I think there's two reasons why. The first is that the, the ARPA CTC removed the income requirement and made the credit fully productive 
fully refundable. So there are gonna be some low or, or, or maybe even taxpayers who didn't make any, any income who are able to claim this credit and get a refund return. The second major change here is that uh, ARPA removed the limit on the number of children that you could use to claim the credit. So historically it was capped at three children who you were realizing benefit from for the child tax credit. Now under the ARPA CTC, you're also getting benefit for your fourth, fifth, or, or sixth children as well. So that could be increasing to the larger refunds that we're seeing. And I think all of these, these uh, factors are combining to just push and pull and really pull on both ends of the spectrum uh, for refunds. So next I wanna to speak to refund timing because that also factors heavily into the filing experience. What you're looking at here is a graph from the Government Accountability Office uh, from, uh, I believe the report will referenced. Uh, and this shows the volume of returns that are falling into the error resolution system or errors. Now, before pandemic, we may not have known what the error system was, but now we probably all know that when a return is filed with an error, it falls into the special processing system and it requires an IRS and employee to manually review that return, make adjustments, and if adjustments are made, initiate correspondence to the taxpayer. And that all has to happen before the return can continue processing. So as you see on this graph, about 35 million returns fell into special processing last year, which is about 85% higher than a typical year. Now per GAO, 60% of those errors were related to COVID related provisions. As you can imagine, the manual review that this requires uh, from an agency with staffing challenges led to significant refund delays. Now, looking ahead to this past tax season, we did not, we, we don't know the volume for the errors uh, fallout this year, but I can say we're not seeing those troves of delayed refunds that we saw last year. And I think this is for two reasons. First, enhancements IRS made to the errors process. And second, uh, deliberate steps they took to reduce the number of returns falling into errors. So in terms of enhancements to the errors process, for this year, IRS implemented a tool called Fix Errors, and the Fix Errors could automate corrections to the most common errors in the error system, uh, including reconciliation of these advanced payments. So there may still be high volume of returns falling in errors, we're not sure, but, I, but they're not translating to lengthy refund delays. Now, in terms of my second point on reducing the number of returns falling into errors, I want to circle back to that in a second and change gears and talk a little bit about some of the nuances uh, that we saw this tax season that taxpayers and tax preparers had to navigate. Uh, the, the first item here is around reconciling those advanced payments, either the advanced child tax credit or the third round of economic impact payments, which are reconciled on the recovery rebate credit. Now, issuance of the payments themselves were relatively straightforward. I think they were relatively successful but the reconciliation aspect was still challenging for taxpayers. To help ensure taxpayers got that information right on their return, to try and reduce those returns falling into errors, IRS mailed letters indicating how much of these advanced payments were issued to each taxpayer. Uh, while this was helpful, some of the recovery rebate credit letters were still being mailed out in March after many had already filed, so that may have mitigated some of the benefits of filing those letters. Uh, IRS also included this information in the online account. And it's hard to say how many took advantage of that because we did still see taxpayers struggle to get this right. I think if we were gonna layer on additional solutions to this problem, we would really like to see IRS allow taxpayers to import this information directly into their tax return. That goes a long way to reducing some of those manual entry errors. And it would have also really helped this year uh, because it was very confusing trying to differentiate all the payments that a taxpayer could have received. They might've received a third economic impact payment, advanced child tax credit payments, a top up on the economic impact payment, maybe an interest payment on refunds. So it could have been really confusing, especially this year. The second bullet I've got here is around reconciling the advanced premium tax credit. And this goes back to my point of deliberate changes made to reduce the number of returns falling into errors. For a little bit of context, when you, when you receive a subsidy for your marketplace health insurance, you have to reconcile that subsidy on your tax return on form 8962 and attach that to the return. Historically, if you were supposed to reconcile and didn't, 
IRS would still accept the return, but then it would fall into errors. This year, IRS changed it so that the return would reject when you tried to e-file it. And the goal being, if you could correct it on the front end, you would alleviate burden on the downstream processing. Now, this was the first year that this change was in effect. And so I think that contributes to why it was challenging for taxpayers. The reject for this error was, uh, it was close to, if not in the top five rejects that we saw this year. But I would propose that this change also helped contribute to those normal refund times because it did prevent many of those returns from falling into errors and requiring manual review. The last bullet I've got here is around the employee retention tax credit. So this credit was intended to help businesses weather the pandemic and typically you would claim the credit uh, as part of your refund on your employment tax return, which would for most businesses be a, a form 941. Now, if you don't know about employment tax returns, they have the highest paper filing rates of any major return type. And anytime we see these paper returns, it's contributing to that IRS backlog. Just last week, IRS still had over 2 million of these employment tax returns in their backlog. And so I think the, the paper and manual processes associated with ERC uh, translated to delays in getting those refunds out to businesses. So that wraps up my filing season retrospective. Now I want to take a minute and look ahead, see how we can apply some of these lessons learned. I think there's really three tenets to administering relief quickly and efficiently through the tax code. The first is there needs to be clear and effective information sharing. A great example here are the economic impact payments. Right after passage of those bills, taxpayers were asking, how much am I eligible for? When do I get my payment? How do I get my payment? But when you run the relief through the tax code, IRS is not the only entity getting asked these questions. Tax preparers, tax software providers are getting the question. If it's advanced payments, financial institutions who help process the payments are going to get these questions. And, it, and it's really critical to get everyone on the same page and providing the same answers to those key questions and all of the other logistical questions because it, it prevents forum shopping and confusion that can happen out on social media. And, and if you can get everyone on the same page, that will go a long way in preventing customer service systems from getting overwhelmed. The second tenet is around leveraging digital tools and automation. I hope during my retrospective, you keyed in on the fact that anytime paper and manual processes are injected, it translate or timeliness and efficiency tend to suffer. So what does that translate to for pandemic relief via the tax code? Well, you wanna be able to leverage IRS's digital tools and automation. And that means leaning on original electronically filed tax returns. The unemployment compensation exclusion is a really good example of this. This was passed in March last year in the middle of tax season. And there's a very clear delineation on how quickly benefits were inured by benefits who filed before or after that law went into effect. So if you filed your tax return after the law went into effect in March, after the software had been updated, you were able to exclude the first $10,200 of your unemployment compensation. And that would either reduce your tax liability or increase your refund. Then when you filed your tax return, if you were getting that refund, you would see it typically within three weeks if there were no other errors on the return. Compare that to those who filed before the law went into effect. Their original return did not exclude that amount, so they would either, either need to file an amendment or IRS would have to adjust it for them. In this case, IRS said, don't file the amendment, we don't want the paper, we're going to adjust the returns. The first UCE adjustment refunds went out in June following that March. And for the most complex adjustments, they're still ongoing. So I think this example really highlights the benefits of that original e-file return, but it also highlights the difficulty of retroactive relief passed in the middle of season and how quickly that can get into the hands of the beneficiaries. My last bullet here is around the budget. Uh, I really just want to say that unfunded legislative mandates require IRS to pull funds and resources from critical operations to implement them. And so to the extent new legislative relief 
can include additional appropriations for the IRS, that can go a long way in helping them administer the relief without unnecessarily impacting other functions like customer service and return processing. And last I'll note that if the initiatives span multiple fiscal years, it's probably best to bake that funding in as multi-year appropriations so IRS can effectively plan for their IT and labor, labor costs across the, the lifetime of that benefit. So that wraps up my prepared comments. Uh, I hope you all took away some lessons learned on how the pandemic relief has impacted taxpayers, their refunds and the filing experience. Hope you also picked up on some of the pitfalls that delay giving refunds to taxpayers, as well as the best practices for administering really quickly and efficiently. Uh, these were just some of the lessons that we learned from our front row seat to the tax filing experience. So if you heard anything here that interests you, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Great. Uh, th thank you very much, Ben. That, that was excellent. And uh, we will have uh, uh, a question and answer period uh, after this um, uh, towards the uh, uh, top of the hour. Uh, but first, we're going to hear from Alex Merjano. Take it away, Alex. All right. Thank you, uh, Will. And thank you, Ben, uh, for your presentation. And thank you all for, for being here. And uh, thank you, Tyler. Um, I guess this is a pretty smooth transition from uh, that last point from Ben uh, to this talk about uh, legislative mandates in the IRS. Uh, looking, at, I'm going to look at sort of how we got here uh, with the struggles the IRS has had uh, in the past couple of years. And there's really, you know, there are several factors that you could point to uh, from not enough. Uh, technological updates to effectively process paper returns, sort of broad decline in administrative capacity and resources at the IRS. Those have been covered a, a lot and in a lot of places. Uh, but I think there's really two trends to think about uh, when thinking about the IRS's uh, existing problems. Is that on the one hand, uh, lawmakers have decided to rely on the tax code to deliver major social spending initiatives, adding benefits administration to the IRS's normal responsibilities as a revenue collection agency, while at the same time, IRS capacity has not expanded enough to match those new major responsibilities. And in the long term, the most stable solution is to move social spending out of the tax code and let the IRS focus its resources on revenue collection and taxpayer customer service and um, the core purposes of a internal revenue service. Um, since the creation of the first refundable tax credit in 1975, the earned income tax credit, the number and generosity of refundable tax credits has significantly increased. Uh, for those uh, unaware, uh, refundable tax credits are tax credits that can reduce your tax liability to below zero dollars. Uh, this effectively is equivalent to uh, some sort of government spending program. Um, now the two largest refundable tax credits are the earned income tax credit and the refundable portion of the child tax credit. Others, of course, include the premium tax credit, American Opportunity Tax Credit, as well as during the pandemic, economic impact payments, more colloquially known as stimulus checks or stimmies, uh, if you spend too much time on Twitter, as I do. Um, the importance of these tax credits has grown significantly. In, in 1991, uh, for some perspective, the IRS had a budget of $6 billion and sent out around $4.9 billion in outlay payments or, or refundable tax credits. By 2000, the IRS's budget was $8.4 billion, and the IRS sent about, out about $27 billion in outlays. Uh, things picked up significantly in response to the Great Recession, as in 2008, the IRS distributed almost $90 billion in outlays relative to an administrative budget of $11.25 billion. So from 2000 to 2008, they moved from a three to one ratio of, of social spending to administrative spending to around eight to one in the Great Recession. Um, throughout the 2010s, the eight to one ratio stayed largely consistent until 2020. That's when the pandemic threw things into a second year. In 2020, uh, the IRS's budget, uh, administrative budget was around 12 billion. 
By contrast, they sent out over $360 billion in outlays, largely thanks to the uh, economic relief administered through the tax code um, passed in March 2020 with the CARES Act. That took so the ratio of benefit spending to administrative spending from about eight the year before to uh, 30 to one in 2020. Things only escalated further in 2021 with the American Rescue Plans increased the child tax credit among other changes. The IRS did receive a budget increase uh, of about $2, $2 billion, um, but that was paired with a massive increase in, in social spending through the tax code, all the way up to $760 billion in a ratio of $55 of social spending for every dollar of administrative costs. Now, an increase in social spending does not necessarily suggest an equal scale increase in administrative budget. Um, Social Security, for example, spends roughly $166 in benefits for every dollar of administrative spending. Additionally, over time, thanks to productivity improvements with digitization, agencies might be able to do more with left. Again, going to the might be able to do more with less. Again, going to the Social Security Administration as an example, administrative costs in uh, the SSA have not exceeded 1% of their expenses since the 90s. But there are two notable differences between the IRS and Social Security to highlight here. But number one, benefit administration is not the IRS's only purpose. Indeed, it's not even its main purpose. What has effectively happened is that benefit administration has been scotch taped onto the IRS's mandate. It's not, oh, you have this money to administer benefits. It's, you have this amount of money to perform your regular duties of, of collecting taxes. Oh, and by the way, you also have these series of benefits to deal with as well. And I, the, the second point is that the IRS's social spending is often quite complicated. You might imagine if it, you had a single program which paid $1,000 to every individual in the United States, Andrew Yang became president in this timeline or something, uh, then you would assume it wouldn't require a huge administrative lift to just increase that to $2,000. But when there are numerous different benefit policies with complex eligibility requirements, it's a different story. Uh, and that's definitely true about the earned income tax credit and child tax credit or EITC and CTC. Uh, those programs are difficult. Um, for example, the commissioner of the IRS, Charles Reddig, recently testified to the House Ways and Means Committee that there's a 25% error rate in earned income tax credits, which translates to more than 17 uh, billion dollars each year. In 2018, the IRS estimated that 25% of the 73 billion in EITC claims were improper. That meant uh, 18.4 billion in improper payments, 1.2 billion of which were recovered in post-refund enforcement. Um, and the GAO has found that these high error rates across the major refundable credits is largely driven by complexity. Um, we could go into detail on, on the exact nature of those and uh, what sort of qualifications each program has on income, age, residency, um, relationship between, between taxpayers uh, uh, to determine eligibility. But the long story short, that these complexities make, make the IRS's job, these, these complexities makes the IRS's job um, more difficult. Uh, now, of course, uh, uh, to sort of throw <clears throat> to sort of throw it, it, it back, um, as many people have have noted, and it's been a big story in, in the media and on and in policy conversations that the IRS's budget has declined in, in real terms when adjusting for inflation uh, over the past decade. Um, now they did receive a bump in funding again in in 2021. Um, but it takes some time to rebuild the kind of capacity. And I don't think, well, they've, they, they did, you know, some improvements as, as Ben noted, um, since the pandemic began, it takes some time to rebuild the kind of capacity they, they need. Now, administering benefits in the tax code isn't necessarily always the worst option. Um, uh, any agency would have some adjustment problems when having to en enact a massive new policy without the ability to build out some infrastructure beforehand. Um, and that was certainly the case in the, in the pandemic. Um, 
you know, according to the IRS's taxpayer advocate, which is an internal IRS organization devoted to taxpayers' interests, not really one to mince words about how the agency is performing, um, has said that, you know, the IRS did as well as it could in the face of the pandemic. However, the long-term costs of the IRS's effective dual mandate of benefits agency and tax collection agency were on full display. Um, according to the uh, some highlights from the Taxpayer Advocates Annual Report, tele telephone service was the worst it's ever been, with only 11% of the 282 million calls made were answered, um, carried a, carrying a massive backlog from 2020 into 2021. Um, with processing delays leading to refund delays, a uh, massive increase in the taxpayer advocate services uh, caseload um, without a, a budget increase to compensate. And really, um, the uh, I can't go any do it say it any better than what the taxpayer advocate Aaron Collins wrote in her annual report to Congress. Each financial relief program consumed considerable IRS resources to administer including overall planning, information technology programming, implementation, public communication, and responding to taxpayers' questions and account issues. To, to address those needs, the IRS had to reallocate resources from its core tax administration responsibilities. So that's where we are. Um, and I think there are a few ways to think about how to get out of this situation. Um, I think there's sort of incremental, basically purely administrative considerations, just making the IRS work better with the law as it is. And then there's sort of policy uh, tinkering, uh, just making certain tax provisions simpler and easier for both the IRS and for taxpayers, and that will make um, both, both, of, both groups' lives easier. Uh, and then there's sort of more radical reform, which is um, in, in certain cases abolishing per certain provisions entirely, in other cases moving them out of the tax code uh, and into a different agency's purview. Um, but I think I'll start with the, the sort of more basic reforms. Uh, there are certain plenty, plenty of analyses from the GAO and Taxpayer Advocacy Service to Advocate Service to, to consider. Um, one of the big things from the GAO's report recently uh, outlined modernizations to the Where's My Refund program, which the IRS's way of informing um, taxpayers' refund status, but there's a lot of information that it, it doesn't cover, um, such as why a refund might, might be delayed. Um, digitization is another area of the IRS's operations that has lagged behind. Uh, the IRS often has to manually enter information submitted to the IRS systems on paper. Um, leading the Taxpayer advocate, advocate Service to call paper filing the kryptonite of the IRS, um, improving these sort of data intake, intake processes with, with better scanning technology would um, make it easier for the IRS to, to shift resources around and save um, tens of millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars. I'm sorry if billions came out, that would be quite a reach. Um, Another thing that I haven't really talked about that's sort of related to this is the tax gap or the amount of money owed in taxes not ultimately paid. Um, one program that has been, has been successful and illustrates the kind of reforms that could help the IRS work better, both for taxpayers and revenue collection, is the return review program, a uh, new fraud detection software that determines which returns should get audited, um, which means that uh, both the IRS both ends up sort of catching more returns that have issues with them um, and also means leaving law, more law-abiding taxpayers alone and not, not um, hitting them with the, the burden of an audit when they haven't um, made any, any major mistakes. Um, exist, and then at a second level, the sort of tinkering reforms um, Existing credits could be uh, simplified significantly. Um, on paper, one might assume that the earned income tax credit is focused on income and the child tax credit solely focuses on support for children, but you would be mistaken. The earned income tax credit fluctuates depending on family status among 20 other requirements. Um, uh, 
and because the requirements for for children child, qualifying children related provisions lead to the costliest errors in the EITC, there are a number of proposals to uh, consolidate child related tax benefits into one provision and work related tax benefits into another. Um, and so this analysis, uh, uh, these types of reforms would make these incentives sort of more transparent to taxpayers um, while also uh, improving compliance and reducing the administrative burden. Administrative burden. But uh, the big picture here, the big, big kahuna is uh, uh, reducing the social benefit responsibility, administration responsibilities of the IRS entirely, allowing them to primarily focus on, on revenue collection. Uh, many proposals suggest moving this child tax credit entirely out of the tax code and putting it under the um, uh, portfolio of the Social Security Administration. Of course, such a move would entail additional costs and trade-offs, um, with the transition of the program and obviously new administrative responsibilities for the Social Security Agency uh, for administration. But in combination with simplification of the earned income tax credit, it would make the, it easier for the IRS to focus on its primary mission of collecting revenue from the federal, for the federal government. Um, now, of course, just moving the child tax credit to a different part of the bureaucracy wouldn't necessarily reduce administrative costs on its own. However, when the IRS's budget has proven less politically savory, perhaps a, a budget item, it would make more sense to entrust the administration of vital social programs to an agency with perhaps better, uh, more stable funding. Um, I guess I'll conclude here. In, in the Analects of Confucius, when asked the first thing he would do to improve governance, the famous Chinese philosopher suggested the rectification of names. Things and actual facts should be made to accord with the implications attached to them by names. But more simply, agencies should fulfill their stated purposes. Having the Internal Revenue Service serve as a benefits agency is a divergence from its core mission, and it's high time we refocus. All right, that's, that's all I have. I'm ready to move on to, uh, to questions. That's great, Alex. Thank you. I uh, always appreciate the long view there going back, uh, what are we talking about, 3,000 years or so uh, when Confucius was uh, dealing with these issues. Um, so ex excellent stuff. Uh, thank you uh, both uh, Alex and Ben uh, for those remarks. Um, and we now have time, uh, quite a lot of time here for a few questions. Um, and please submit them. Uh, uh, as you can uh, on the, the Q&A um, channel there. And we have a few, a few questions that we put together uh, to get the ball rolling here. Um, number one, uh, Politico recently reported that this tax filing season could feel like a lottery with some lower income households eligible for refunds of 20,000 or more due to several tax credits, uh, many of which we've been discussing here, the child tax credit, which uh, uh, this last year maxed out at 3,600 per child, a child care and dependent tax credit, which maxes out at $8,000, and stimulus payments of $1,400 per person, uh, as well as expansions in the earned income tax credit and premium tax credits. But many of those same households do not normally file a return because they earn less than the standard deduction of about 25,000 for married couples. And they, and they don't understand why they should file. And so these low-income households will, will miss out on these benefits. A December survey uh, finds, uh, finds that about five to 6% of households eligible for the child credit were not receiving them because they did not know how to get them. In total, for all these tax credit pro programs, do we have a, any sense of the share of eligible households that are not utilizing or fully benefiting from them? And if, and if they are disproportionately low-income households, are these programs achieving their goals? And what are the costs? Alex, maybe we'll start with you and then, and then move to Ben. Yeah, so obviously there are a lot of different credits with different uptake rates um, for each, but I know that when compared to, I think, more conventional 
social benefits administered elsewhere in the tax code for the most part. Um, uh, for the most part, programs like say social, social security tend to perform much better on those metrics uh, than, uh, uh, than these tax credit programs do. Uh, similarly, um, I think that um, sort of unsurprisingly that the administrative burden of having to assess eligibility uh, ends up being somewhat re regressive as uh, it's, it's more difficult to, to na navigate the uh, 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 eligibility requirements if, if you are say, you know, you know working two jobs to, to make ends meet, dealing with these sort of complex administrative processes might not, um, might be a lot harder to, to manage. Um, so I think that's certainly an issue that uh, uh, we face. I know that the EITC uptake rate, I think is usually what I've, the number I've seen is around 75%, um, which, which I don't think compares particularly well to uh, uh, other programs. Great, Ben? Yeah, thanks, Will. You know, I, I think uh, what you described really ties into some of the refund trends that we are seeing this year, where that average refund is up at the same, but at the same time, the the, the balance due filer percentage is also up. Uh, and I think you can definitely attribute that back to removing the income requirements for credits like the child tax credit and the recovery rebate credit. Uh, and I think we are seeing some of those, you know, hard to reach populations of non-filers coming in to, to garner those benefits. They are filing some returns and I think we're seeing it in those larger refund volumes this year, despite the fact that balance returns are up. Uh, in terms of how many filers or how many potential filers are not coming in, that's a really hard question. It's a really hard population to reach through the three rounds of economic impact payments and advanced child tax credit payments, one thing we learned was it's incredibly hard to reach those hard to serve populations. It really takes everyone holding hands together. It takes deliberate outreach through community groups to get the word out to those groups and help them file tax returns if, if they are eligible. And so I, I think we are seeing some of it, but it, it again, it's just hard to tell who is still out there and missing out. Got it, got it. Okay, and so Alex, you're, you're proposing um, the child credit, um, in particular, moving that to the Social Security Administration or a, a, some sort of you know, uh, uh, combined child benefit. Um, and can you talk a little more about um, how the Social Security Administration reaches these, these uh, particular populations that don't file? Or, or yeah, do so I think... So I think the idea is that you know the IRS has to manage a lot of different information when determining things for like eligibility for uh, the CTC from uh, you know when when we when employers do withholding they don't ne uh, always necessarily factor in all the details of a uh, uh, person's situation and all of the you know different peculiars of perhaps their their spouse's um, employment and income or uh, certain you know you know side job self-employment income all st stuff like that um, so I guess that's partly more a structural concern with how the the program is designed uh, rather than the administrative advantages of the the Social Security administration vis -vis the or versus the IRS um, but I think the performance of Social Security uh, as a benefit administrator, I think, is much stronger than the IRS's. And uh, couple that with some simplification uh, to the eligibility structure of the CTC, I think that would translate to a, to a more effective uh, benefits uh, delivery system. Um, yeah. Okay. Great, thanks, thanks a lot for that. Um, now, let's move on to another, uh, another potential solution here uh, that's been floated um, at, that is increasing uh, the budget for the IRS. And so as you, as you noted, Alex, uh, there was a bump up in, in the IRS budget in recent years, actually, uh, after several years of uh, essentially flatlining 
um, uh, from about uh, uh, 2011 until 2020. Um, the budget was uh, uh, around 11 or 12 billion. It got a, a boost of about a billion in, in 2020 and another one and a half billion in 2021 and uh, to a total budget of uh, around 14 billion now. And uh, so that's 22% growth over the last two years. Uh, that's growth in appropriations, not, um, again, there's a challenge of spending that money. So the outlays um, uh, for administration at the IRS uh, may, not, may not match those appropriations. Um, but uh, do, you, do you think the IRS budget is the main problem here or a problem? How does it rank in the, in the list of problems uh, for the IRS and for taxpayers? And to what degree is uh, these, these other issues, uh, particularly the increasing policy, policy scope for the IRS to blame um, instead or in addition and in combination with the uh, budget issues? Um, uh, Alex, again, we'll, we'll start with you and then move to Ben. I think it's kind of an enhanced, uh, it's a um, uh, self-reinforcing problem. Uh, uh, or, or the sort of some of the two problems of uh, increased policy scope and uh, you know declining budget in real terms or or whatnot. I think that uh, one the 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 combination is much worse than the sum of either problem in isolation. Um, but as far as the IRS budget goes. Um, I think it takes time for a increase in budget to necessarily translate to better service. Um, I think we saw some improvements uh, over the course of the pandemic, but um, you know when you think about the process of hiring, you know the IRS promised to, to hire you know ten thousand workers, and they promised that in, in March to deal with the. Um, surging, uh, uh, they're dealing with the backlog, they wanted a surge of, of new, new hires, um, which, you know, might help the backlog over the course of the, of the year. But if you think if, if you um, think about any organization having to, you know, hire somebody and then, uh, you know, train them in the job and uh, then have them sort of get the hang of it themselves, you know, it's going to take a little bit of time to uh, get them to be, you know, producing at the rate you want them to be to be producing at, uh, or, or you know, producing being, you know, work output, however you would like to measure that, um, re returns processed or something, um, and so, and that's just with when thinking about labor. That's not talking about the uh, information technology, which is of course the IRS very famously are archaic, um, and so those transitions will also will also take time. So I think those sort of structural uh, improvements, the IRS's operations are important, um, but it might take a little bit of time for that to translate to sort of a, a, a recovered uh, tax taxpayer experience. Yeah, Alex, I, I could not agree more that it definitely takes time to rebuild. That was one of the points you made earlier that really resonated with me. Um, you know, I think the, the budget certainly is factoring in here. When you look back over the last 11, 12 years and the, the, the decade of budget cuts prior to the recent increases in budget, one of the results of that was a hiring freeze for the better part of a decade. And so IRS employees are, are missing out on this whole generation of employees because they weren't able to replenish their pipeline of talent for a significant period of time. And I think we're starting to see some of the, the effects from that trickle into the, the, the tax administration world as well. And so I think these increases in budget are, are a good start. Um, you know, we always talk about kind of how much to appropriate the IRS, but I wanna take a second and talk about how we appropriate funds with the IRS, because I think that's really critical to ensuring effective tax administration. The, the way the budget process works today, they're appropriated funds on an annual basis, and it's split out into four separate buckets for taxpayer services, enforcement, operation support, and business modernization. Uh, you can have some inner uh, appropriation transfers, but largely those buckets are pretty well set. Uh, and, and Commissioner Reddick has mentioned this a couple of times over the last few weeks. Apparently IRS has been subject to 100 continuing resolutions 
since 2001, meaning that they have not had a full years of appropriation. They have not known how much money they will have for a full year of appropriation over a hundred times in the last 12 years. It is very challenging to accomplish long-term initiatives like modernizing their IT stack and staffing, restaffing the agency after those budget cuts when you don't have uh, the, the budget numbers to work from. There's a lot of start stops to the IT projects. Each time that CR goes into effect, there's a start stop. But there's a lot of one year contracts to try and, and perform this work. And it's just really hard to, to know you are gonna have the money to pay individuals you hire if you don't know how much money you have. And so to the extent, you know, whether, whether we're giving more money to the IRS or not, I think it's really important that we consider how we can give them multi-year appropriations that help them better plan and execute these long-term goals that they need to accomplish. They really need to be able to modernize their system. They need to be able to have adequate staffing. Um, one last point on the staffing in this most recent uh, budget, they were granted direct hiring authority that drastically reduces the amount of time it takes to onboard these employees that they're they're competing with private sector against hiring. If it takes weeks to months to bring them on board, it's a lot more difficult with this direct hiring authority. They can get the resume at a job fair, they can make an offer on the spot. And I think that has helped them uh, in their hiring efforts. And so I think all of these things combined, you know, how we do it, maybe it's a gradual increase over time to, to back to Alex's point that it takes time to build up and train the employees. Maybe we should be thinking about a gradual increase in more multi-year appropriations as well as authority to hire more quickly. I think that all those things together can go a long way towards improving tax administration. Okay, great, great, great ideas there. Uh, thank you both. Uh, another question um, broadly, uh, what is the best way to simplify the filing process for taxpayers and the IRS, particularly in regard to the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit? Should the IRS be allowed to fill out simpler returns in advance for taxpayers? The IRS currently provides a free file program with certain limits. Should that be expanded? Ben, let's start with you this time and then Alex. Yeah, thanks, Will. Um, you know, and, and Alex mentioned this a couple of times, you've got um, a conflation of, of benefits. The EITC, it sounds like it's for earned income, but it also incorporates how many children you have. And then on uh, child tax credit, there are some phase out amounts and earned income requirements under on ARPA CTC rules. And so one way to simplify that could be to kind of bifurcate those benefits and have one directly tailored for earned income and another directly tailored for child benefits. I think the question is just, does that accomplish the goals that you set out to? Is that what you really intended when you tried to get these benefits into the hands of the recipients? Uh, and if it does, then, then go for it. And if, and if it doesn't, then maybe we can continue with the current regime and look to make some improvements like uh, harmonizing the definition of a qualifying child. There's five different definitions for a qualifying child today. That's pretty confusing, even for someone in the business. Um, you know, on, the, on the, the comment about IRS preparing returns, I think this gets very difficult when you start layering in complex family situations. So the IRS typically is not going to have, uh, or they're not going to know whether or not a child was living with their parents one year and then a grandparent the next year. And so the tax return filing experience, that, that retrospective look back at, at your tax year to file a return and establish your eligibility for these different credits, it, it works fairly effectively in that regard. It allows you to look back and say, no, the child did live with me more than six months of the year. Um, so I, I think if you were talking about uh, the government preparing returns for these complex family situations, it would actually be very difficult to get it correct and accurate. Alex? Yeah, as far as sim simplification and, and the, the sort of tax process, uh, I, I want to look, look back at the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, and, you know, P Paul Ryan often talked about the idea of, of, of filing, filing your taxes on a postcard. Um, and there was briefly a sort of small, uh, you know, form that they sent out, you know, in, in 2018, uh, that would say, look, look, you can sort of, the, the form you file is, is, looks like this, but 
it, that just meant that you pushed all of the other stuff into different papers that you also had to fill out and your just final return was looked really small. But you still had to deal with all the um, substantive processes just on a different piece of paper. Um, now, uh, um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, though, did simplify the tax code. Or, or at least simplify tax filing for, for a lot of taxpayers, but it wasn't through the way return looked. It was because the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act raised the standard deduction and so um, reduced the share of, of taxpayers that itemized. And so fewer taxpayers now have to, uh, fewer taxpayers have to keep track of uh, all these different types of, of expenses that uh, are only available to, to deduct if you want to itemize your deductions. And so um, the substantive reform to the tax, how the tax code was structured, not the sort of minutia of the detail, uh, the, the sort of minutia of, of the tax filing process is what is what drove the, the, the reduced compliance burden for taxpayers. It wasn't the, the tinkering on the edges, it was the substantive change in how the tax code is, is structured. Um, and I think that is a, a point, you know, worth thinking about as far as, um, you know, you can tweak around the edges on administration, but um, what the underlying tax code is matters a lot. And I think that's also true in a lot of the places that do have this sort of a free filing system where the tax agency will fill out uh, returns for you. Um, usually they don't have very many uh, social programs or, or complex um, deductions built into the code. So it's a lot easier for the IR for for or whatever the the um, foreign um, tax service to to send out um, pre filled out returns because they don't have to marshal that much information. Great. Well, that's that's the last word. Information sounds like a lot of information is going back and forth between millions of households and the IRS every year, and so. Um, Maybe the solution is reducing the amount of information that, that uh, uh, is going back and forth there. Um, so uh, uh, thank you both. Thank our panelists here, Alex Bergiano and, and Ben uh, Denecki. Um, I appreciate your expertise, your time, and uh, great ideas here at a, um, a long running uh, uh, problem in public policy and uh, one that's fortunately not likely to be solved anytime soon. So we may be talking again this time next year. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, um, we will see you again at the next Talking Tax Reform event. This one has been recorded, as I mentioned earlier, and can be accessed on our website uh, very soon. And thank you all for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.